Provisory management. Letters and signs. Fred Bugs, State Line Boys and Girls Clubs. I'm Angela Beckwith, and I also work at UW Medicine within the School of Education, and I work on career development. Tim McGowan, I work here at Edgewood, and I work in the School of Graduate Professional Studies. All right, Sully Forest College, uh, Dubuque, Iowa, and I work in student development. Secret Allen, Ma Madison College, nursing instructor. Okay, thank you. All right, let me give a, a formal introduction of, of Mr. Haight. William Haight is a native of Madison and a graduate of UW-Madison. He's the founder and president of Magna Publications, Inc., a producer of five newsletters and three national conferences for higher educational institutions. These conferences typically draw as many as 1,000 participants from colleges all across the country. In 1988, Magna acquired the business magazine, In Business. In recent years, Magna has been delivering more of its content via online audio and video seminars and takes full advantage of social media tools. Bill is very active locally and is chairperson of the advisory board of the Greater Madison Convention and Vis Visitors Bureau. He's a board member of WPS Health Insurance. He's a member of the Dane County Regional Airport Commission and volunteers for a number of organizations in our community. In 2001, Bill received the Madison Advertising Federation Silver Medal Award for lifetime contributions to the field of advertising. Bill is married to Nancy and has three children. Bill is also responsible for me meeting my wife, and he has been a friend for over 20 years. Please join me in welcoming Bill Hayes. That, that was one of my major accomplishments. <laughs> Wonderful coincidence. And if I don't mind, if you don't mind, I'll have to tell you I first met Chuck. Must have been 30 years ago. It's been a while. <laughs> and, uh, he was at uh, UW Oshkosh in multicultural uh, relations, and we needed a speaker for a student leadership conference that we were sponsoring. And, and uh, I came across Chuck, and Chuck spoke at a number, quite a number of our conferences. And then when he came to Madison, we kept in touch. So. Uh, and yes, his wife and, and, and I were uh, working together on a committee and somehow I brought Chuck into the committee and things happened after that. So anyway, um, I'm going to um, assume that uh, we're going to talk about marketing and I'm going to start, well I'm going to pass out if you would, I've got it, this is a, uh, a, a very non-graphically uh, uh, designed uh, kind of an outline that we can cover along, you can make notes in it and so on, and it's got some reference material at the end. So there's there's a lot of stuff, I, I'm hoping that I'm going to leave you with stuff that you can go and dig deeper into on your own after the course, things that I've discovered that you probably wouldn't have come across. But if, if you would, please, let's just follow along uh, and starting on the first page, um, we're going to talk about marketing, obviously, and the, the four P's of marketing. Uh, I'd like to bring this up because so often people jump to the, the fourth P of marketing, which is the promotion part, but the four P's of marketing are the product, price, place, and promotion. Uh, the product, a lot of people don't realize that the product itself really is where marketing starts. The, the market, you don't, you can't market a product that isn't uh, well defined, you, your, your marketing efforts will be scattered. You can't. Your marketing efforts do have to be in tune with the product. This is where your your branding comes in. For example, if it's a college like Edgewood, I notice that uh, well, the branding is a, is a whole subject in itself. It's it's not a logo. It's not a slogan. It's not it's not a, it's not an image. It's all of those, but it's much more. Um, and I was out in your parking lot, for example, I noticed that the some of the, the the, the, the words that connect, uh, community and truth and justice and so on, and all of that fits in with the product itself, and that has to be something that's in tune with all of your marketing efforts. You have to go back to that. Uh, in everything that you do, you have to kind of keep going back to that. I'm assuming that many of you are interested, be, uh, because of the, uh, being educational leaders, uh, in mar how educational institutions themselves are marketed, how the organizations are marketed. Uh, but I'm also going to cover a lot about what, what my company does, and that's marketing to uh, 
uh, educational institutions, and, and I'm assuming that as educational leaders, you'll want to know both. You'll want to know, you'll, you'll, you don't want to be naive about how outside firms and, and organizations market to your uh, institution. So we're going to cover cover both of those. And by the way, since we're a, a small group, I'm, I'm going to try to pack a lot of stuff into a, a short period of time. And like I said, uh, a lot of this is things that you can follow up on your own. I'm going to give a very brief touch on a lot of different things, but let's be sure to ask questions as we go. Because if we come up, if, if I'm talking about something that's of particular interest, let's dig a little deeper into it. It'll be very easy to do in a small group like this. Um, one of the first, uh, well, promotion. A lot of people, when they think of marketing, they think of one or more of the elements of promotion. These would typically be advertising, uh, direct, ma direct mail, search engine optimization, uh, uh, which we'll get into a little later, social media, which we'll talk about, uh, email blasts, public relations, which I think you have done some media relations and things like that, uh, and sales. When, I mean, when I'm talking about sales, I'm talking about an actual sales force that goes out and, and sells over the phone or whatever. Those things are all different elements of promotion, and a lot of people think that that's what marketing is, when in fact it's really uh, it's really only one part of it. It's a big part of it, of course, but again, the, the first element, the product, I, I can't stress enough that that's really where you have to start. The branding, uh, the image, the what you are, what, what the institution is, or what the product is. Um, the first cut in thinking about marketing, too, is, is really, are we talking business to business, or are we talking business to consumer, B to B, B to B? Uh, is one business selling to another. That's what we do. My company is it's called Magna. Magna sells to another institution, even though you're a nonprofit, it's still business. It's, B2B doesn't necessarily mean that you're a corporation. B2B is, is, is selling to an institution or a company or an entity. Whereas B2, B2C, business to consumer, is you're selling to the end user. So uh, a college or a high school or a, an institution or a uh, nonprofit uh, would be, if, a college for example, if you're recruiting students, that would be business to consumer because the consumer, the, the, the end user is going to be the end user, the person that you're targeting is going to be the end user of the product. Whereas what we're selling is we're selling our company, we're selling for example webinars and, 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 and training, we're selling to a consumer audience, they, they are not to a consumer audience, to a business audience, because the person that's buying it is not using it for their own personal use. They're not, they're not the ultimate end consumer, they're using it in the capacity of their institutional role. So B2B, and, 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 and if you're doing both, then you probably have to have a, a different marketing strategy for each, because they're quite different. That gets into the audience, and who is your audience? Uh, and I'm gonna, talk about a couple of the things that it seems simple you should know who your audience is but it's it's really can be fairly complicated uh, and I'm going to give you an example in our company and we've been struggling with this for years it seems so simple but we put on again a student leadership conference the same one that uh, was I think Chuck was at probably our very first one in fact I'm sure it was <laughs> our very first one uh, we've been doing this for over 30 years but we still grapple with the idea of, well who is our who's our customer there the unit of sale we think of it's it's by institution because a school an institution will send anywhere from one to ten to twenty students to our conference. So the when we think of it, we think of oh that that college you know they're they're a good customer because they send ten students every year. So that's part of it. But institutions obviously don't make the buying decisions by themselves. People do. So who makes, who, who do we target our marketing to? Who are we trying to inform and influence, et cetera? Uh, and it can be, you say, well, it's the student. Well, yeah, maybe, but the students turn over year after year. What influence do they pay? Well, yeah, they, they, a student, if a student hears about our conference, 
they may go to their advisor and they may say, hey, Mr. So-and-so, we'd really like to go to this conference. It looks great. Okay, so are, do they have the authority to make the ultimate you know, purchasing decision? Maybe they do. If it's student activity fee uh, type of situation, maybe they do. Or maybe they only are influencers. We have the same thing with our faculty. We do a faculty conference. And the same thing. The, do the faculty, do the, does it start from the top? Does the dean go to the faculty and say, I have... Uh, decided to send four of you to this faculty conference, or does it start with the faculty going to the dean and saying, you know, we found this, this great conference, do we have funds to do it? Could you work it in somehow? We'd love to do it. Uh, by the way, there's also the element of, of knowing your audience, and, and, and we're, we're discovering that there's this element of collegiality in, in uh, higher education, and, and uh, we're told that deans don't tell faculty you're going to this conference. In a business environment, in a business environment, the boss might say, I want all of you down in the conference room at 10 o'clock because we're going to have a webinar on uh, human on, uh, human resource uh, law, and you better be there. And it doesn't work that way, um, uh, I understand, in a college situation. So you have to have a, a little more of a communal uh, approach to it. Yes? So would you consider all of those people sort of your audience, right? Yes, you have to. Okay. Yes, yeah, you, you have right. to really. You have to think of all of them. And, and then you market. You try to market to each one of those. The, the reason I'm asking that question is I work at a career development website yeah. that we build for students. The students don't pay for it. The school district pays for it. So it's this. It's yes. a very similar thing where right. you, the teachers aren't going to use it unless they. It's easier for them to use, right? But then you also have to build it so the kids are what somewhat engaged. Because if it's not a website, the kids want to be engaged. Yeah, you know, it's very similar. That's exactly the kind of thing that I'm, right. I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and you have to, and and, and to, to answer your specific question, yes, you have different, maybe different messages for both of them. Right. You tell the teacher uh, the, how this is going to make their job easier, and it's how, right. how they're, they're going to be able to fulfill their mission. But the students, you really need them to be using it or it won't be successful. Exactly. And then, of course, you need whoever's the higher up the to recognize that it uh, fits within the mission, the overall mission of the institution, and it will be good for everyone. So. Right. Well, can I, I guess, drill this a little further? Because in talking about the audience, a question that we've had or are having is it just relates to the institution's website. Is it an enrollment tool? Is it an alumni tool? Is it a HR tool for attracting other? Is it just general information? I mean, it's the same kind of yes. question, and I'm just trying to figure out. That's I don't want to derail us, but no, no, that's a question that's, of kind of how. Right. That's an audience, it's all but we're not. Right. We're really saying, well, where do we marshal our resources and, and our our message? Is yeah. It? Um, well, the way the way I would look at this is most of the promotion that I talked about, advertising, direct mail, SEO, social media, and so on. Today, most of that effort is to, to get them to your website, as opposed to maybe in the old days it was to call or to write away for something or to come to our place of business. Almost everything now, there's that intermediate of a, of a stop on your website, first of all, to get more information, and then you might do the next step. So I guess the web, the website itself, it's an element of marketing, but it really can cover lots of different things. And your promotion should send people to the appropriate section of your website. I guess that's what I would say, uh, to, the, to the appropriate page. Because you wouldn't want, I mean, your website really does have to solve. And, and of course, you look at a lot of university websites, and they'll, they'll have at the top students, faculty, yeah. prospective students, parents. Yeah. You know, others, right. and then what kind of leads them down the next path? Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that's a that is a, a and I, by the way, I have a a CD which I'm going to give you, uh, and I, I normally I have we have people that produce great powerpoints, and I have put all this material together, and I, but I couldn't. We're everybody's so swamped right now in my organization, I couldn't with a straight face. Can you make me a powerpoint for this? class for Saturday, so that's why I don't have my presentation on a PowerPoint, but I did, do have a CD here for This one's called Six New Essential Elements in Web-Based Marketing, and it's strictly related to education, so I'm totally appropriate. I'll give you each one of them when we're done here. Thank you. Uh, okay, so then, yeah, web marketing, uh, 
one strategy, and, and on, on page three here, uh, it says Makota, uh, one strategy for driving people to a website uh, is to give away something free and get people to opt in. Uh, we do that, and an institution might do that by offering a free report on six mistakes that parents make when they pick a school uh, or something like that. And people, when they come to the, to, when they go to, the, to, to get that free report, they have to give their, their email name. That's all they have to do. They have to opt in and tell you who they are. And after that, then you continue to solicit them. And they start by getting something for free. And you probably send them some sort of an announcement or something, out, depending, again, on who they are and what the track is and what the timing is. And you send them something. And uh, eventually, you move them up the chain, whether you're trying to sell them something or ultimately get them to do the next step. That's a request enrollment information or pay on campus visit or whatever. So that's just that's one theory of developing web traffic, uh, this what's so-called the quota system. Um, we use this a fair amount because we have a, we have a, a free uh, newsletter called Faculty Focus. And we've got, I think, about 40,000 opt-in readers now to that. And it's, it's totally free. And most of those people never buy anything from us. But some of them will. And a few, few of them will go up the funnel and be, become very major uh, purchasers. They, uh, once they've learned uh, of our resources, they become trusting, trusted, they trust us, they're familiar with us. And so that's this theory, that's, and it's only one way, one theory. Uh, SEO, we're going to talk about search engine optimization. Have you gotten into that at all in any depth? So I, I want to add you. Okay, well, let, let's talk about that because that's, that's real important these days. SEO, and what that basically means is if somebody's searching for something, they're going to find your website. And, uh, you know, when talking about a Google search would be typical. Uh, there are things that you can do to, uh, before we get to the sample, these are, these are some of the things that I've been told because search engine optimization is a real science and an art. And uh, one of the things that'll, the idea is you want your, when somebody search, uses certain search words, they're gonna find your website. And you want people that are the, the right kind of people. So the way, you, some of the things that will rank high in the little behind the scenes algorithm that Google uses will be recency, if you're recency, that is if you're posting material frequently, they don't like old stuff the age of the site, it's just the opposite. They won't, they won't rank a brand new site very high until you've been around a while. Um, <clears throat> the relevancy within the page, and they have their ways of doing that. What they, they really are wanting is to give their people that use their search engine what they're looking for. So they have ways of doing that. And I'll show you some examples here in a minute. Um, I've also heard, although a lot of this stuff is proprietary and Google doesn't tell you and they change it all the time. But a lot of people have told me that they see that uh, websites that are the, the .edu websites tend to be favored over the .com websites. Another thing is um, if the term that you're talking about is actually part of the page name, the URL page name, that'll rank higher. So if it's like uh, admissions information, is, is actually the page name, part of the page name, that would rank higher than if that piece of admissions information was somewhere within the page. The structure of the page itself is, is important, and people that put together websites are not necessarily all equally knowledgeable about that. Uh, and, and there are some misconceptions, again, because it changes all the time. Google changes their, uh, their, their rules all the time because they don't want people to catch on to them and start gaming them. Used to be what you know when webs first came out, what 10, 15 years ago, you could you could plug up, use meta tags, and you could just use the same word over and over and over and over again. If you put it in there a hundred times in some sort of a hidden area, then the idea was that Google, because what happens is Google comes to every site every so often and goes to every page and indexes everything. It looks at it, it pulls parts out, and it indexes it. In, in, in huge, it's a huge, huge volume, obviously. Used to be able you could you could put repetitive words and then kind of trick it into thinking, oh, this 
this, this one says quality higher education, and you've got it in there a thousand times in some sort of a little hidden area, and then you can trick Google into thinking, oh, this page is really about higher ed. And then, of course, they, they, now if you do that, it will actually, you'll get demoted for that in the, in the Google algorithm. Uh, the same with duplicate pages. If you, if you, you have to be very careful that you don't have, and, and your web people probably know this, that you don't have the same page or virtually the same page twice because you get dinged for that as well. Google says there's something fishy here if it's the exact same page that shows up in two different places. Um, and another biggie is um, the number of sites that link to you. So if, if you can get other sites, legitimate sites, to link to your site and vice versa, that can be uh, a real plus for getting your ranking higher with Google. And then, of course, Google also uh, would have to assume that they're looking at traffic and they're saying, well, this, if, because Google has Google Analytics, which we'll talk about here in a minute, they know <coughs> how many people that come to your site from by searching, they know how many people come to your site uh, and how long they stay there and how many pages they look at. And so, you know, you got to assume that Google is going to favor those websites that have that the people that go there have a good experience. They stay a long time, they look at a lot of pages, you would assume that that's going to be a plus. So all those things go into SEO. Now I wanted to show you uh, on the, the next page this advanced web, web ranking report. This is what we use uh, to keep um, track of the keywords and the, the search terms and actually our writers will write in a way that highlights the terms that we feel will bring the right kinds of people to our site. It, happens. it goes into how the, if somebody's writing a special report and they can use a phrase uh, in that report in a certain way, uh, it, will, it will make a difference. So, so just for example, now the first one, you see the first, the first keyword there has got a quote around it, and that means that that exact phrase has to be searched. And you can see there's only 100, the competition, meaning how many pages uh, that will, sh will sh that exact phrase will show up, and it's only 132. <laughs> well, the rest run into the million, some of them. By the way, the, the legend for these various terms are at the end of that uh, section of all that data. But the next, uh, let's go down to the to the um, one that says a asynchronous learning and trends. Okay, now what this means is that if somebody searches for just types in asynchronous learning and trends. There's going to be 62,300 pages that show up on the Google. We, meaning this, uh, our uh, website, and this we've got five websites. This one is FacultyFocus.com. It's going to show up number one. It's going to show up in the first place, and it'll obviously it'll be on the first search page on Google. Um, now, why that is has to do with all. Not only the competition, the competition enters into it, obviously, if there were, if there were, as you can see on some of the others where there are millions. Let's go down to college faculty. See, college faculty, you type in college faculty, you're going to get 35 million hits. Our faculty focus is going to be the 45th one you're going to come across. You're going to have to page through five different pages of Google results before you get to us if you're searching for... That's, that search term is way too vague, obviously. It, it's going to pick up way too much. The next one down, college learning and teaching, 219 million. But let's go down to um, the net down there where you see distance learning tools. Distance learning tools. There's 18,400 sites that have distance learning tools, and yet our site ends up, ends up being number one. So what this means is that Somehow, when Google goes to the page that it, it finds on our Faculty Focus website, it somehow determines that that indeed is what people are looking for when they're searching for distance learning tools. Even though there's many, many others that'll come up that we're competing with. So it's, it's uh, we've, we, use a, we use a service called uh, called Word Tracker, and that gives us another element that doesn't show here, and that's how many people are actually searching for that term. So what we're looking for is we're looking for terms that a fair number of people search for, but that don't have a lot of competition. 
and then we try to use those terms, assuming they're appropriate uh, for our for what we are. We try to use those certain terms because if there's a fair number of people searching for them, and it's and, and there's not that many website pages out there that have that term, our chances of ranking high are are, are much better. And that is a constant. We're, we're doing that really every week. I mean, it's constant because it changes that fast. Yes. Uh, do you, I, I guess, set goals as to. I mean, when I look at this, you got lots of number ones, which is I would think a good thing. But in terms of an organization, where I guess where would a, where would an organization be happy if you weren't number one in terms of bidding on terms? I mean, again, out of 26 million and you're at 47, that seems good as well. Although I realize that you've got to get through five or six pages of Google could, to get there. Yeah, well, I mean, they, you they, set goals to say, hey, you want to be number one in the well, search. Well, I, th I think I, I, don't know. I think the general rule of thumb is you want to be on the first page, right. which means you want to be one of their eight or ten. Eight, most, you know, I guess people can vary how many they want to see on their Google search, but you know, if you're eight or ten, you're probably still going to be on page one. And they say most, you know, the, the drop off is really great if you're on the second page. Is people generally are going to pick something from that first page of Google result. But probably a better metric is not really so much because I mean, they're looking at how many keywords there are. This is just sort of a, an ongoing, endless thing. You know, it's not like, okay, once we get to this point, then we've accomplished it. It's just right. always a better metric is, is really the, um, uh, the Google search, uh, and that is how many people, how many, how many people come to your website. How many unique visitors come? How often they come? What's the bounce rate, which we'll talk about? How many pages do they look at? How much time do they stay there, stay on your website? So this may this is only one way that people are driven to your website. That search engine after There are other ways too. And one of them is you just send them an email with a link to your site. That has nothing to do with search. It doesn't have anything to do with Google. That has to do with the copy that's in your email. So SEO is great because, and people spend a lot of time on it, because it brings you new people that you don't already know about. Uh, that, you know, in other words, if somebody's searching for, let's say, Edgewood College, they already know Edgewood College, most likely. Edgewood College, Madison, Wisconsin, okay, fine. They, they, they're, they're not, they're not, they already know who we are. But if, if somebody's searching for, you know, uh, quality colleges in the Midwest and they end up on the Edgewood website. And all of a sudden you've got something that you didn't have before. These are maybe people that are overlooked and you've, you've accomplished something. Uh, so so you, that's where the search engine optimization. These are not people, the, the person that's searching, somebody down in Texas that's searching for quality colleges in the Midwest and they find Edgewood and then going to the Edgewood website and then from there whatever good things they find there they follow up, follow up. You're not going to reach that person down in Texas most likely with an email blast because you don't know them at all. You have no way of identifying. They identify themselves. That again goes back to this Makota method is another thing. If you can send people to your website to get a free report, um, They've self-identified themselves as being interested in that subject. So if you're talking about, um, you know, how to select a quality, how to how to select a quality uh, school, or how to, and you, you, keep in mind there, as you can see here, there's so much competition that you really have to keep narrowing it down. Because if you just say how to select a quality college, you know, how, that's you know, there's going to be a lot of people out there here you know, Hey, Bill, what are some strategies to get other websites to, to link to your website? Uh, to get others, uh, uh, well, there again, it has to do with content. Um, I was noticing, we, uh, we have a free newsletter, Faculty Focus, again, and, mm -hmm. I, and I'm only saying that as an example. When I was looking at some of these examples, um, I checked, because I, I wanted to see if there are some, you know, when the Google web, the Google Analytics shows you what other sites are linking to you. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about that. Why are they linking to us? And I went there and I found they had they had our publications on their website. There was another, mm -hmm. they were colleges and there's our thing is free, it's free material. So they say, okay, here, I'm telling our faculty, this company here has free faculty uh, development material. And so they put us a link to us on their website. So that's, that's one way to do it. There are other ways to do it through kind of mutual 
you know, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. I don't recommend that. That's, the, that's a look for a look for an educational ed institution. I don't think that's going to work all that well. Yes, sir. Uh, that was sort of the question. I mean, you don't have to ask for permission to be linked to somebody. So. Generally, you don't. No, 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 you don't. You generally you don't. It's just a matter of here's a website. Um, well, what's my link? You don't want to link with you. You don't want that linkage. I mean, well, <laughs> you know, it's it's a free country, and our website is now. There's parts of our website that are for for subscribers only, of course, and we have uh, a number of publications that you have to pay for, and when people pay for them, we make it clear that you you can. Yeah, somebody's they'll buy a, something for their entire campus, right? We, have, we make it clear that if you put this on your website, it has to be on a portion of the website that's only available to your, your internal staff and faculty. It can't be on a, and every once in a while we find a college that's put our, you know, they bought our products for their school, and they put it on a public website where anybody that stumbles across it can get all this stuff from us for free and of course we it's a, it's a mistake they're not doing we know they're not doing that to try to cheat us it's just an error or misunderstanding and we tell them you know, please don't do this but uh, generally speaking no there there's a little bit of a controversy about uh, publications like um, you know if if you say here's an article from the New York Times and then you put the New York Times uh, web link on there the New York Times doesn't care about that they like that because it's sending people to them but if you're selling a service that says, I'm going to give you a digest of the top news stories of the day, and then you put the New York Times on there, they're not going to like that because you, in effect, are, are taking their material and reselling it, reselling a service uh, without compensating them. So that's, that's the only place you'd get in trouble. Uh, okay, let's go on to email blasts. And this kind of almost talks about a little bit about what you're asking, too. Email blast. Um, first, most important thing in an email blast, and again, an email blast is where you, you, you're sending out a bunch of emails, and it could be a large list or a small list, and in most cases, you're going to be directing them to your website to try to, to do the follow-up thing. You're probably, in your email, you're probably not going to say, you know, call our admissions office. You're going to say, check this page, and it'll tell all kinds of good stuff, and then somewhere along the line, it'll say, you know, write to our admissions office or, or, or we'll click here for more information. But the list is always the most important. So, um, I, you know, it's fairly obvious if you're selling, trying to recruit students, if you're trying to recruit students to a accounting class and you send it to a, a list of physicians, you're not going to get a very good response. And uh, that is really um, where, the, where spam comes from. It used to be in direct mail, which Chuck and I was, was in the ancient days, that's all there was. Um, that kind of took care of itself because you had to pay a fair amount of money for postage and printing. And you wouldn't send a mailing to somebody unless you were pretty sure that it was going to be effective. Well, unfortunately, with email, which is virtually free, it's not totally free, but it's free. I mean, you can send out millions compared to direct mail, it's virtually free. People have stopped being so concerned about the appropriateness of their list. And too many people just use the idea of quantity versus quality. That's where the term spam comes in. And we, we kind of generically think of spam as anything unsolicited that comes to us. And the worst kind of spam, the worst kind of junk, the worst kind of junk mail, too, is something that's just totally inappropriate. I've gotten on some kind of a list that has something to do with, uh, I don't know, learn how to Learn how to become, go, go to nursing, nursing school is what it is. And, and I mean, I, I'm not, I'm, at my age, I'm not looking for a career in nursing. I'm sorry, where did they get my name? Why do they keep hitting me with that? And, uh, but then there's a, obviously even worse examples than that of, of stuff that's just totally inappropriate and it's sent out. So the list is really important. Um, and uh, then, of course, the subject line to get you to open the, the email. <clears throat> then the offer, that is, what is the offer? Are you offering to sell them something directly or, or co go to our website and you'll get a free webinar on how to pick a, pick a college or whatever. And the copy that describes that is important. And then the final, uh, the, the, the least important, although not unimportant, is the graphics. 
a lot of times people make the mistake in marketing of going for the graphics first and they'll look at something and they'll say, oh wow, it, this is, wow, yeah, that's great. And look at that, it's got you know, a nice cover and a pretty picture and all that. And it really, you know, is really the least important thing. If you show your, don't make the mistake of having someone outside of the target audience judge your, your promotional materials. If you take something and you show it to your, you know, your mother-in-law or something, they're going to say, oh yeah, that's pretty, I always liked uh, tan, yeah, that's really nice. And it have, would have no bearing on whether, now this is not particularly graphically attractive. If it were going to be sold in a store, we'd probably design it totally differently than that. But, um, so anyway, the, so since the list is the most important, now we're going to talk about where do lists come from. There is a Can Spam Act in the United States, and that I've outlined the principal parts of it. Don't use false or misleading information. Don't use deceptive headlines, etc. Uh, if you read through that list, you'll note that none of these items that are prohibited by the U.S. Can Spam Act uh, mention sending it to unsolicited people. In other words, it is okay to send things to unsolicited people that you don't have a relationship with that you uh, have compiled from some source. The only thing you have to do, you can only do it once if they tell you not to. But other than that, you're, you know, it's, it's fair game. Now, I, I was researching this, and I discovered that in Europe, some of the European countries, they have a further uh, requirement, and that is that the email subject be the commercial, and these are for commercial type solicitations, commercial email. The, the, the offer has to be appropriate to the audience, to the list that you got. And the example that they that they used in the, and it's, that's a judgment call, the example that they use, let's say you're selling uh, faucets for kitchen kitchen sinks. Well, if you send that list to the, to the general public, the, the advertiser could argue, well, you know, we're, we're the Kohler company and we sell this to the general, everybody is interested in faucets when in fact uh, it's really the only the whole plumbing wholesalers that they should have been soliciting that was kind of an example that they used and that would be that would be one that was kind of borderline you know and then but then the rest of them that are obvious I mean if you're sending a solicitation of, to uh, uh, you know for wedding uh, essentials or something and you're sending it to people it should be to a list of people you have some reason to believe are interested in that subject but that's European in this country there's really no such requirement so what's the recourse? So if I'm getting an unsolicited email and there's a law against well, it, where do I go with that? I've asked that question a thousand times. It seems like nobody. Yeah. The, the, well, I used to, it's unsolicited and you've I tried to opt out and or there's no provision. I have some mail that I've seen where there is no provision to opt out. That's clearly a violation. Of course, so much of the mail is clearly fraudulent too. I guess the answer is that there's not much anybody can do about it except go after the very, very, very large uh, offenders. Most of them are operating out of foreign countries, and so it's just hugely difficult. I also feel that a lot of the people that are kind of doing this are very naive. They may be dupes themselves. You know, they may have an they may have answered an ad that says, you know, make money at home, and then they get a bunch of emails and says, send this email out, and you'll get this. And they themselves are are fools. They probably paid for that. And, you know, so it's like, but I agree with you. How can we get so many obviously fraudulent and misdirected and violation of the can span and, and nothing happens? Right. <laughs> if you buy, like if you buy a list, like we use a company called the NBR out of Chicago, and if you use them, like you purchase the list from them, you have to fill out all that information. But like if you just went and got a list of all these different names, you don't, there's not like a template, but you form an agreement with the company that you're getting the, the list serves from, and you do have to indicate all that information, like where your physical address is. So somebody could potentially, like if they didn't want to be on that list anymore, could potentially figure that out, but I don't know. You know, if you just get all these lists of emails, I'm not sure how it happens. Yeah, uh, well, you know, again, you should be able to opt out, and yeah, MDR is, is and I've got their catalog here, oh, yeah. their contact information is in here, they're a big list, <laughs> list broker, and the, and the actual, the actual um, email services themselves, 
will require you to, right. um, uh, you know, to, to, but that's not the ones we're talking about. We're talking about the ones right. that are trying to beat the system and what do you do? And, you know, I don't know. It, I, unfortunately, it's really making e email a, it's damaging email as a legitimate force of marketing. Did you also find, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but they're saying kids aren't using email anymore. That's that's <laughs> exactly right. right. Email is old. It's mm -hmm. really old. Yeah. Right. And, and, I, and I business. I don't well. know that like this like the research behind that. I just heard people say that. Yeah. They use they use text. They use Facebook. They use the, the different methods and rather than traditional email. And I'm hearing more and more uh, you know business and professional people the same thing. They're saying. I just don't have time to go through all that email, right. all that junk, and it's really too bad. Um, I know Microsoft has made some efforts to really try to try to crack down on people, but it doesn't seem to have made a dent in the, in the, the email. Well, it, along those lines, there's another way of, of, of compiling lists, and I think in the MDR and some of those companies like that, they compile their compiled lists. They're not opt-in lists, but it's public information. If you go to a college website, it's just public information. Chuck Taylor is a professor and they said this is his class. And so they compile that and uh, they put it in. It's a compiled list and uh, not too much you can do about it. I mean, it's you know, it's sort of like the president of Edgewood College can't really have an unlisted phone number. It goes to the territory. You can't do both. So, um, so, so that explains why I get all the spam now. <laughs> right. Well, again, I, I, I would contend as somebody who uses uh, compiled lists that there's several different levels. There's, there's one is that you want is the opt-in people, the people that are your customers that know you. That's good. That's the top level. A second level would be a compiled list that's appropriate. In other words, and I mean really appropriate, so that if I'm going to send out uh, something to admissions directors, it's only admissions directors, and it's only admissions directors even of a certain type of college so that my mail, it really hits the mail. Now that's not a legal thing so much as it is just good marketing. It's just good sense, and, and it's ethical too. It's, 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 it's ethical to try to not bother people with stuff that, that they don't want. There is another method of, of uh, list compiling that I'll tell you about, and uh, there are, just like Google crawls through websites and looks at every page. There are there's software that will do the same. And I'll admit that we have used it. Uh, and we, what you do is you feed in a URL of a bunch of colleges, and it will crawl through every page on that website, or as many pages deep as you want it to go. And it, when it finds a name, a phone number, and a title, an email, whatever, it builds a database, so it would go through the URL to edgewood.edu and all of the pages under that, and it might come back with 50 or 100 or even 200 names. Titles will be matched with some of them. Some of them will have phone numbers. Some of them will have emails. Now, when we first heard about this software, I, I actually consulted with an attorney that. Um, in our industry and asked about it. He said, oh, absolutely, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing illegal about that. There are, there are prohibitions for, um, what do they call it, harvesting uh, or, or manufacturing uh, emails. There are prohibitions against that. So I, I couldn't just take a system and, and say, oh, okay, I see Charles is, is charles.taylor at edgewood.edu. Therefore, I'm going to program a computer to send it to John uh, Jones, et cetera, yeah. Jim Jones, Bill Jones. Yeah. Send a million things on the assumption that you know a fraction of them will get through and they'll actually get a real name. That's illegal, and any legitimate email provider would boot you right off because, of course, you'd get 99% of them would come back as being undeliverable, most likely. So, uh, but, but that actual, I was surprised that actually having a robot that goes through and finds names is no more illegal than having a person do it. Yeah, having a person go to a website, it's just an automated thing. So what's the name of the software? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's actually a company out of, uh, it's a company out of um, Milwaukee called, well the software's called Profiler. 
profiler software. And uh, the company, I can't remember the name of the actual company, but I could get that for you. Wow. And it's, it's, it's kind of expensive, mm -hmm. um, but, it, but you can use it for all kinds of things. In fact, we have a, we have a business magazine here, and we're compiling names of uh, email addresses all throughout the state. And, and there's nothing illegal about it. We're not, oh, this is one thing that, that the, um, that the uh, lawyer told me. A lot of websites will have a prohibition on the website itself that says you cannot use any of the names off of this website. So I'm saying, well, gee, how would we know that? Like if a college had a little notice on, on its homepage that says do not, and the, the, the attorney says, no, no, that's not what it means. It means you have to actually opt in and check. You know, it's like when you first time you go to this website, there's a little box that says, I have read the terms and I agree to them, and here's my name, here's my name, and I check here. And if you see that, no, then you can't. But a, a website that you get into, which would be virtually all college websites, uh, you wouldn't have that kind of a prohibition. If you go to Facebook or something like that, it, or, or any of those kind of proprietary, you somewhere along the line have agreed that you're not going to do that. So you couldn't go and use profiler software on, on Facebook and gathering names that way, because when you signed up for Facebook, you specifically were told that you're not allowed to do that, and you agreed to that. So there's the difference. Yes. I have a small business, and once I try to send an email blast, and what happened is that many people check, it seems, spam, and so my website was actually blocked. It was like blacklisted. Does that happen often? Yeah, you know, it, it, it does, and, and it's funny that that doesn't happen more, and I, I guess I just have to know the, all the details of it, but um, th that, that could be very damaging, of course, if, some, if too many people report you as being spam, it can be damaged. I have never had that, although I've heard that happen. And so I'm not sure what the threshold is. It's like, you know, if you send out a, a, a mailing and a few cranks, you know, check and say this is spam, that may be acceptable, but it, there's some threshold. Probably they don't tell you either. It's like they don't want you to game the system. Anyway, um, can spam direct mail? Direct mail, uh, as we've discussed email is maybe becoming less effective and, and there are some people now that are saying direct good old direct mail is still around it still is a good way to meet to reach certain audiences if it's appropriate the same thing is uh, true there um, when you're talking about uh, the, the list is the most important that is uh, there are whole industries that compile uh, names of prospective students and uh, there's all kinds of uh, prospective student databases and companies that do that for a fee. That's their whole business. One on the research page, on the very last page here, um, or second to the last page on page 11, you'll see there's a company called uh, Edumarketer. Uh, it's it's a, actually it's a LinkedIn group. It's not a, it's not a company. It's a group. And if you if you're interested at all in that, this is one thing I really recommend is that you sign up for that group. Just go in there and do groups and, and join and join that LinkedIn group. You won't be you won't be inundated with junk. Uh, they, they'll let you, only let you into it if you you know if you're if you have a title or whatever that seems like you're genuinely interested. And you can check it maybe once a week, and you'll find all kinds of interesting discussions about recruiting uh, students and getting names of prospective students uh, and, and other related things. Bill, Bill I've got a question. When, when you, the faculty focus, you said you had 40,000 subscribers right. up in. That's, that's substantial. When you, were, when you were starting out, how did you solicit those names? Did you? We, we used the, we used the quota method for that faculty focus. We started from zero mm -hmm. and we put out special reports and we still do. We have we put out a, a valuable special report. It's not, it's not a sales pitch, it's an actual report that people <coughs> will find through search engines, and they opt in, they give us their name, say, we'll send you this free report, and we'll send you faculty focus every week. And they give us their email and their name, and they get the report right away, and they are on our list to receive faculty focus. After they've received it for a while and decide they want to opt out, that's fine too. They can do that. But it, so it, it grows. I mean, there's always a little percent that opt out, but it's always growing. So it, it really took a couple of years to get up to 40,000. It was not definitely not an overnight success, and it's very it's a slow pain, 
slow process, but it's a good quality because these every one of those 40,000 are people that have actually said, hey, yes, I want this. And that's a lot more valuable than 40,000 compiled names that, uh, you know, don't, don't, you know, you don't know really anything about them. Um, what, was, what was the question? I didn't hear it. The question was how long, how did we compile the names, or how did we get our circulation for this free faculty folks, how did we get it up to 40,000? Okay. And we got it through this sending out free reports and so on. Now, uh, social media, and, and again, the only thing I can say on social media, and I know you have done some of this on your own, is yes, it is becoming really hot, it's really important, it's changing all the time. My feeling is that things that are being done today, a year from now, things will be so different, things that we can't even imagine today. I think there are, there's, the thing you have to remember is it's easy to set up a Facebook page. But when you look at these numbers, uh, there's so many other people doing it too. There's one thing that hasn't changed, and that's the human capacity for information. And I can be interested in, you know, a thousand different subjects, but in the course of a day, I, Technology-wise, I can you know I can receive everything I could possibly want on that. But I personally, and the, the the I'm the lowest common denominator. I can't process that, that all that information. So the more specific you can be, uh, that's the secret. It's the technology can't 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 do that part of it for you. So um, the it's it seems like. The young people today have an endless capacity for their Facebook and their linking and so on. But even there, there are, there are limits. They're, they're dealing with a certain finite group of friends. The software is changing all the time. Facebook making those kind of changes because they recognize that. They're giving people more options. So instead of having a thousand friends, now you can still have a thousand friends, but you can have you know, 200 best friends or whatever it is. And, and so that is a... Um, it's extremely important because of the of the diminished use of email. More and more people are communicating with that. And a lot of it will just have to do with a, starting with a strategy, starting with your strategy. What what kind of an affinity group would make sense for your product or service, and then working at it. Um, there are agencies and specialists in this that uh, to try to do it yourself. I would definitely not recommend that. I would get a specialist to kind of guide you through this, talk to lots of different people, get some references, because there are probably some quacks out there too. In fact, I'm sure there are. But there are there are some people, and there are lots of them that specialize in this just within the education market. Um, I was going to show you something about, um, if you want to go to page eight, this is Google Analytics. This will drill down a little bit. I'll show you what Facebook has done for us. Google Analytics, are you all familiar with it or somewhat familiar with it? And this is a this is for our faculty for focus uh, page uh, website. And it shows that these are the at the top of page eight there, it shows that there are three different kinds of traffic. Direct traffic are people that just come. They type in facultyfocus.com. They come to us because they, they know it. Uh, referring sites, they're people that went somewhere else and, and, and they, maybe they were on their college website and kind of, they went to their faculty development page and it said here's a free resource and they clicked there and it was referred to us. And then search engines, so you know that's good, half, roughly half of our stuff comes from search engines and like I said that's, that's pretty desirable because these are really new people that we probably would not have uh, uh, reached any other way. Uh, so that, 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 ref, that the search engines themselves brought us 33,600 pages within, uh, out of the 65,000 visit, visits within uh, probably within a month. This is probably a month's figures. So then under the tra top traffic sources, it shows us Google uh, it was the largest single source. And then the direct, that's people that just typed in faculty focus. Those are obviously people who already knew us. Uh, Cheetah, that's our email service. These are emails that we send out that had a link to Faculty Focus. Then Bing, which is another search engine like Google and Yahoo. So then we can see the, the search words, the keywords in the top group of them. And of course we can go on, these are just the top five, but effective teaching strategies is the, the, the one thing that people typed in that brought in the most single number of visits. And then on the next page, so this is what I was going to show you. This, this is the referring sites. 
and you can see there that Facebook is the third referring site on there, and we have a Facebook page, and we have somebody that works, you know, pretty hard at trying to trying to keep our Facebook presence up. But you can see that the number is really relatively small, 496 uh, out of uh, the 8,000 that came through this source. So it's not like it's some for us anyway. Now this site here is for teachers, faculty, college faculty. We have another site, like I said, for student leaders and college student leaders and student organization leaders and things, residence hall leaders and things like that. And that would be higher, the Facebook presence there is higher on that for those people. But um, this is the kind of thing you'd be monitoring if you had a Facebook, a Facebook uh, strategy. You'd work at it and you'd be monitoring this to see if this number goes up, if you're getting more and more and more referrals through Facebook. And, and then obviously re revising it and changing it so, uh, here is a, a, a neat thing. This again comes from F MDR. MDR is, is I, I urge you to uh, go to MDR and, and get this catalog. This is their, even if you're not going to buy a mailing list, it's got all kinds of neat stuff in here about um, descriptions of, you know, counts of how many, you know, colleges there are in certain categories and lots of definitions and, and all kinds of good stuff. I really urge you to do that. That's where this chart came from. And this is really a pretty neat snapshot of the higher education marketplace. Uh, anybody that wants can take this one copy. I only have one. We've got more in the office. And but you can, like I say, right away and get your own or email, email them, because that is in the back of the, the book under resources. We're also going to give you one of these um, CDs on six new essential elements in web-based marketing. And then this is a copy of our newsletter that we put out. This is a paid newsletter. Uh, I've got a copy for each of you. And this happens to be the current issue. And it just happens to be the headline here, the top front page article. It says, study shows ubiquity of and increasing confidence with social media in recruitment. <laughs> so I figured that's, that's appropriate. So I brought a copy of this for each of you. We have, um, we have five newsletter of five paid newsletters and I invite you to uh, any of you here that go to our website and see a newsletter that you want to subscribe to including recruitment and retention let me know just give me an email say and, and I'll put you on the list compliments complimentary for six months uh, sign you up for subscription just email me and say hey I'll take you up on your offer and I'll, you know you'll start getting it and you'll get a renewal notice at the end of six months and if, you know, just let it expire if you're not further interested in it. Um, and then the, the list here, I really do urge you to, I think maybe one of the most valuable parts of this whole morning, if you find one or two little gems on this list that you follow up on your own, that you might not have otherwise known about. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of them unless there's questions. Other questions for our guests? This has been an excellent, go ahead Ann, what's your question? Um, you know, like you send out all these emails, which are sort of like, like you said, they're free and you still have something to write up. But then, like, how do you do, like, the return on investment? Like, how do you figure that out? I mean, like, MDR designs is not telling you, um, you know, if somebody clicked on the link, you don't know if, like, what they found out. But then you can buy your hot leads, which is nice. And then do like a follow-up email. But yeah, we don't. We don't buy emails lists uh, from other sources for the most part. Okay. But our but our web our web um, mail does give us that kind of information, and we can tell who um, clicked on it. And we can tell uh, who or, you know who clicked on the link, and then we can also follow them and see well did they not only click and go to our website, but what did they do? Did they buy something? Did they sign up for something? And we can obviously we can tell the undeliverables, so we can remove those. Uh, they, they automatically keep an opt-out list, which is a requirement. And, and again, it's not only because it's a legal requirement. You know, you don't want to do things that aren't right. right. Um, and we take people off if they say that they do. You know, along the same lines too. One other thing on this interactivity of media, um, social media, we have just added on our on our some of our web pages the little. Click here to to chat for more information. Yeah. So it's a live chat. You've probably all seen that. 
And we've never had that before, but it, it, it's really been effective, especially for a page where there's some maybe some complex questions that might be asked, and we're getting a little the text because people are used to texting. They, they know that if they call, they're going to probably be put on hold and all that stuff. So they text. And sometimes, it, so if there's nobody there, we're a small company, so if there's nobody there, they, if, for example, overnight, the little symbol on the page changes from click here, it says click here and we'll respond tomorrow or something like that, it won't be live. And you now they'll come in in the morning, there'll be a question or two and they can quick respond to it. So I'm thinking, boy, that's, that's really kind of a, that could be one of those breakthrough kind of things that will be really be best practice in web design uh, before we know it. Because it may have been fairly complicated a few years ago, but it's not anymore. Other questions? How, how do you avoid Mario situation? Let's say you, you've got a, a brand new newsletter. You're getting ready to, to send it out. Any, any advice for that, especially in the, maybe in the subject line or somewhere so that they know it's unsolicited, but at the same time, it's valuable information that you want them to click and take a look at that e-newsletter. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you had that experience. The only thing I can think of is, um, yeah, you well, you know, having a good have, the list is really the most important thing in that case because even if you have a good headline, they're going to still look at it as unsolicited junk if it's not appropriate to them. So that's, I guess. The, the east, well, the best way would be, again, to, to go for opt-in names, to try to use SEO. Now, this is a long process. And it, if you're just starting, you don't, you want to take, you need to take a shortcut. So you need to do some outbound blast using, you know, compiled lists. Where did you get your list from? Compile it yourself? Yes, I did. Well, from, that, from, should, yeah. that should have been, emails. That should have been um, you know, a good list. And I'm, I'm surprised that you got people that would come back and, and call it spam if it were you know, appropriate. Um, your best source on that is to talk to your list, um, your email provider. And it might be you know, a good email provider uh, will have good relations with the various spam filter or whatever, whatever, who, you know, like Google or whoever, whoever proclaims, oh, this guy did something bad and we're going to call him spam. And I would say maybe talk to several different email, because if you just use a generic one that's designed for the general public consumers to send to their friends, they're not too sophisticated about that, but a business email provider will, will, in fact, they won't let you send stuff. The provider we're working with right now will not, will not let us send any list unless it's an opt-in list. We have another provider that we use for the, for the list that we compile. They won't do it because they don't want to have a bad, they have a good reputation. So they, they in effect kind of can be your intermediary in and so Google looks at them and says, hmm, okay, even though I got some complaints, for this email, but it came from Cheetah Mail is the one we use, and it's not cheap, but they have a good reputation. Uh, but then again, in the long run, your best bet is again to, to compile, get opt-in names by offering something free on your website, letting people come to your website, get something free, sign up for it. Say, I'm, I want this, I want a, you know, is it a paid newsletter you have? No, it's not. Free newsletter, okay. Good. That would be, you know, Get them to come to you first. That that that's that'll be a better quality name. But you, you, there's there's still ways you should be able to send unsolicited <coughs> compiled mail without getting in trouble. Thank you. Yeah. When you're developing your website, do you go? We just had this conversation in our office because we're changing from programming dot classic doc as to dot net. So we decided. And one of the questions became, they call it the three-click three rule. Do you guys talk about that at all? I've heard of that. It's like, do you, yeah. you, you need, yeah, you, you can't make it too complex. Right. Yeah, you, you know, you'd think it would be so easy to make it. And it's, it's even, you know, even big websites like the airlines are, you can run into situations that just don't make sense. Right. Uh, you just have to keep working at it. But yeah, we've done, we've, we've, We've made improvements over the years. And 
get people to test it. There's where you can get your, your mother-in-law to get some, give you some input. Say, here's our website. <laughs> Try to order this. And they come back and say, oh, I got here and I, 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 I didn't understand this. I clicked here and I got back here and I got here. And, I, and he, then you go in and you say, oh, man, we've been using this. Nobody's noticed that. Right. And, and you'll, you'll find that. So you've got to keep testing and trying to improve on it. Another question. So I just I was just flying last weekend, and I this was my boarding pass, which was crazy, right? Like it had the tag on it, and I just put my boat on the scanner. What do you, do you see that as? I mean, yeah, you know what? I, I that seems here, like the next here's another thing. hand I, I I got for everybody. Uh, this magazine, Today's Campus, is one of the resources that I, uh, I've got on the resource list and you can send away for this. I just, while I was flipping through it to see if it was appropriate for this class, here's an article, QR codes gaining yeah. popularity on like, campus. So here you go. <laughs> and, I, and so I made a copy of that for everybody too. I forget, almost forgot that, but that's the QR, that's what she's referring to right. is this little code here. Uh, and it's a, it's a great way of taking somebody, uh, they, they, Photograph it, and it takes them right to the website. So it's it's a good way of, and I've heard the the post office even subsidizes that because the post office really wants print printed material yeah, to stay alive because you know that. But this is a way of you know taking you from print to the web. Right. Because so. in our office, I was just sharing with the group, uh, we're working with a company that we you would put that on your business card. And then yep. your business card, I would scan it, and then I would all of your information yep. would go right into my phone. Yep. Now that's something that's relatively new because oh, yeah, those right. bar, those various kinds of scan codes and barcodes and all that have been around in, in different forms. This one, you know, may be the one that takes gets traction and becomes the standard. No, the one that they're using now. Okay. Is that? Are we out of time? I have. To, I I can stay. Any, in any other questions for our guests? But I don't want to cut into other time here. This has been excellent. Let's give our guests a, a well-deserved round of applause.